Spirit family, happy Valentine's Day. Uh, in honor of Love Day, you have the opportunity to win a dozen donuts for you and for a loved one or a friend today. We'll send a dozen to anyone you choose here locally if you're one of our winners. Check out Current's V-Day Challenge over on our social media at current.sv on Instagram or Facebook for more information. We are a community following Jesus together, and you're welcome wherever you are on your spiritual journey. Whether you're joining us today rested and joyful, or totally exhausted and having a really difficult week, we're glad you're here. And we hope that you have the opportunity to sense God's presence with us together this morning. If you're new with us, there are many different ways to get connected. Uh, it's a great time to be getting involved with our church family. The easiest way to take a next step this morning is to fill out the connection form over at currentsv.church slash connect to give us a chance to share more information with you about the church and what's coming up. We also have a welcome lunch coming on uh, Sunday, February 28th, right after the second gathering that we'd love you to join us for. Uh, it happens online over Zoom and our team will drop you a Starbird chicken lunch uh, to enjoy together. It's an opportunity to hear about uh, current, uh, our story, how we got started, our vision and values, what's important to us. Uh, and you'll also have a chance to meet a couple of our leaders and give us a chance to get to know you as well. You can RSVP for this lunch over at currentsv.church slash welcome lunch. All right, let's go over to the band to worship together now. And then we'll also have an exciting glimpse of our new facility for 2021 the outdoor space coming up. And David will be here with uh, the message on enduring this morning as we continue onward in the book of Hebrews, so relevant to our lives this year. See you soon. Seeing the one. 
so say I see the world in light I see the world in wonder I see the world in light Bursting in living color I see the world your way I'm walking in the light Ever seen the wonder In the air of second life Thank you. 
All right, well, good morning and welcome everybody to Current. My name is David. We're so glad you could be here. We're really excited coming off the heels of our live stream test last week. Uh, we're really excited because it was successful and we still got things we gotta work out. But thank you teams for helping us get that together. Of course, we're thankful to the Lord that we have this opportunity to put it out this way. Uh, and really our hope, the reason why we're so excited is to have an option for those of you who are ready uh, to come back to in-person gatherings, God willing, sometime here in the, in the near future. Uh, if you are ready to come back, that is a desire of yours. We're going to be as thoughtful and, and approach us as safely as, as we can to have an outdoor experience ready for you, at least initially outdoors with social distancing, with you know, screening and with pre-registration to account for limited capacity. For those of you who are not yet ready to come back, we completely understand. That's why we're doing our best to have the online experience as best as we can for you. And so we just encourage you to continue to engage as best you can in that format. The reality is there is risk no matter what we do here. Unfortunately, I mean, there's, there's risk, of course, as we go to meet again, even as we're doing that as thoughtfully as, as, as we can. But there's also risk in terms of not meeting together. I mean, everyone, of course, knows the numbers, or at least the reality, that there are a lot of, of issues happening interpersonally or of mental or emotional, and the list goes on in terms of, of those rates skyrocketing. Because of isolation, we haven't met for, for so many weeks, almost a year now. The reality is, as a church, we want to be able to position ourselves thoughtfully, safely, uh, with God's help to meet needs and provide options for you and to serve our community and our church body. So, so would you pray for us in all this? Of course, we're praying for, for you, church family. Would you pray for the leadership? Join with us in praying that the Lord would lead us in all of this, that he would guide all of this. Uh, we really hope and pray that we'll be able to, God willing, soon begin to uh, meet again together, all of us, with, with this pandemic uh, behind us. Cindy will share more after the message, so be paying attention uh, for, after the message as well. Uh, let me pray, and then we'll get into today's message. Father, thank you so much that the live stream uh, was successful last week. Thank you for, for each person on the team that came out to help. Uh, Lord, would you, would you please go before us in all of this? Lord, would you please protect and keep people safe, keep the church and, and really, you know, society. Lord, I thank you that this, these vaccines are coming out. Would they continue to, to do good things and have good results? Um, but Father, would you just help us as your church follow you as best we can? Uh, we just, we want to follow you and, and do what you call us to in the midst of these challenging circumstances. And then Father, as we turn now to your word, would you please open it to us? Would you please give us your spirit to understand what you have before us? We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, if there's one word that summarizes the series that we've been in, it's the word to endure. Uh, the, the word that would summarize this whole thing is to endure. Because in a way, we've been asking, in the midst of challenging circumstances, how can we endure? In the midst of challenging circumstances, how can we stand strong? How can we have great impact? And this makes sense because really the entire letter of the book of Hebrews is about enduring. And so we come today to the example of Moses, and that's really especially the focus here. How Moses was able to endure, how he was able to persevere, even in the midst of some terribly trying times, we see he was able to endure in some incredible ways. And so therefore, there's a lot for us to learn from his example. So what we're going to do today is look at two things. One, what it is Moses endured, and two, how he endured. So what Moses endured and how Moses endured. We're going to be looking at Hebrews 11 verses 23 through 27. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born, because they saw he was no ordinary child, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God, rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as greater value than the treasures of Egypt, because he was looking ahead to his reward. 
by faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. All right, so first let's consider what Moses endured. So we pick up in the story about 400 years after Abraham. Abraham is who we looked at uh, last week, but 400 years later comes the story of Moses. And to kind of fill in the gap, Abraham had Isaac, of course, raised him there in the land of Canaan, in the promised land. Isaac, in turn, had Jacob. Jacob would later be renamed Israel. Then Jacob, or Israel, had 12 sons of his own, who would, whose families would become the 12 tribes of Israel. And one of those sons was Joseph. Now, we don't have time to get into all of Joseph's story, but the short of it was Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery. And over the series, after a series of really God-ordained events, Joseph ended up second in command in Egypt under only the authority of Pharaoh himself. And in that position, he helped not only Egypt, but really all the surrounding areas and regions weather a just terribly severe famine. And so that also brought down all the people of Israel, Joseph's brothers and all their families came down to Egypt to kind of weather this famine. And that had them uh, resettled in the land of Egypt. Now, after some time, we're told that another Pharaoh rose to power who, quote, knew not Joseph, remembered not Joseph. And he looked at all of these Israelites who were quickly multiplying and got real scared, thinking that if one of his enemies were to attack the nation of, of, of Egypt, that the Israelites could very well join with those enemies and overwhelm the Egyptians. And so, with that fear in mind, he enslaved the Israelites. But the Israelites continued to multiply, and so he eventually signed a decree that all Israelites killed newborn baby boys. And it was in that time that Moses was born. And what we see here in the first verse of our text is that Moses' parents refused to go along with that decree. And so for three months, they were kind of living on the edge, uh, raising their boy in fear of, of death, but just, just making sure that they were going to follow the Lord in spite of all of that. Well, eventually it came time that they knew they were going to be found out, that their boy was going to be killed one way or, or another. And so what they did is they placed Moses in a basket and floated him down the Nile, just hoping and trusting God would do something miraculous. Well, that same day, Pharaoh's daughter was out bathing with some attendants, with some servants, and she no doubt heard the baby crying, saw a little basket floating, and told one of her servants to go retrieve the basket. Well, when she saw there was this baby, she decided to adopt the child as her own. So Moses was raised in Egyptian royalty. And he was really groomed to be a leader. In fact, we're told in many different places of the scriptures that he was a naturally born, naturally gifted leader. I mean, even physically really strong, but intellectually sharp. Well, one day when he was about 40 years old, he was out and about the town and he saw a taskmaster Egyptian beating, just really mistreating a Hebrew. And what he decided to do was step in. Well, in the end, he, he ended up killing the Egyptian taskmaster. And he didn't want to be found out. He, want, he didn't want things to happen and come, or come down on him. So he took the body and buried it in a secret place. Well, the very next day, he was out about again. And this time he came across two Hebrews who were fighting or quarreling among themselves. He stepped in to try to mediate, mediate that disagreement, at which point one of the Hebrews cried out, wait, are you going to kill me like you killed that Egyptian taskmaster yesterday? At which point Moses knew the jig was up, right? It was, it was in that moment he was really forced to make a really big decision. Now the decision he made was to flee off into the desert. But I think we can easily overlook that there was a decision he had to make here. He, he was confronted with making a decision whether to go or to stay because he probably could have gone back to the Pharaoh and concocted a story and gotten out of it. I mean, even in our cultured, <laughs> democratic society today, we know that it's possible for folks of great influence and power to kind of make what they want to have happen be done. Well, it would have been no big deal back in those days. But Moses didn't choose that. Based on his principles, he decided to flee. He fled out into the desert where he would ultimately remain for 40 years. <laughs> 
before God called him out. 40 years. Could you imagine being Moses out in the desert after having made that decision, that momentous decision, and living with the repercussions of all of that? I mean, he must have, for all those years, just been thinking, man, I could have had the life. You know, I was just so positioned with, with power and influence. I could have, you know, taken on so many different things. I could have been living this life. But instead, he was out in the desert. Well, after 40 years, God did come to him and called him out to lead his people out of Egypt and into the promised land. And let me summarize essentially what that calling was that God gave to Moses. God asked Moses to confront the world's most powerful man and to demand that that most powerful man release his most effective and free labor force. And then uh, Moses would be leading out that broken and shattered people with no resources of their own. And ultimately, that it would mean that they would have the world's strongest army with their horses and chariots nipping at their heels. I mean, it's, we're talking about a big calling that Moses stepped into and endured through all the way to the point and, and beyond of getting to the, the Red Sea, of course you know the story, where he had nowhere to turn, saw the Egyptian army coming, saw the waters, looked out over the people and said, go. Moses' story is incredible. He endured some incredible and terrible hardship in some amazing ways. His is an incredible story. His is an incredible example. That's what Moses endured. Now let's consider how Moses endured it. Uh, We're told Moses endured in at least three ways in our text. First, verse 26 tells us that Moses regarded. Moses regarded. This is language that we've seen throughout Hebrews 11. I mean, we were told last week that Abraham, for his part, reasoned. Do you remember that? He used logic. He calculated. Abraham reasoned. Really, this stems from the introductory paragraph of what it means to have faith. Back in Hebrews 3, we're told, by faith, we understand. Uh, Again, this is language that faith in Jesus or or the Christian faith is not devoid of thinking. It's not devoid of reasoning. In fact, it calls us to think and base our convictions on understanding. And so what did Moses regard here? Uh, we're, We're told a few things. Look at verse 24. By faith, Moses refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Verse 25, he cast aside enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. Verse 26, he regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. In short, Moses regarded what was it that was ultimately grounding him. What was it that was ultimately centering him? Where was his life centered? Specifically in terms of his identity, we see here, in terms of where he was looking for satisfaction, in terms of where he was searching to find his treasure. In his book, Counterfeit Gods, Tim Keller talks about how how all of us, religious and non-religious alike, Uh, worship different gods, is the way he put it, all have these idols, Uh, how we all look to something or someone in life that gives us our ultimate sense of meaning, uh, hope, and happiness. And what Moses understood here is that he was not to find his ultimate sense of meaning, hope, and happiness in things that wouldn't last, things that would be temporary in this life. He could only endure if the things that he find, if he centered himself on themselves endure, and the things of this life cannot, will not endure. Uh, specifically, we see that he looked to ground himself in a different identity than one here in this life. It says he refused to be known as the son of the Pharaoh's daughter. That is, he refused to have that wonderful identity of being a part of the Egyptian royal class. I mean, think of the influence, the power, the luxury, the, all the rest of it that would have gone with it. Moses didn't want to find his identity there. And then it says that he refused to enjoy the fleeting pleasures 
of sin. Really, this could mean any number of things, different lusts, different appetites. Could be things that in and of themselves are bad or things that are good, but 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 overly look to for meaning, happiness, and, and satisfaction. He was, this was him saying, I refuse to look for satisfaction, ultimate satisfaction in things that will not endure. Uh, one of life's lessons, it seems to me, is that we will discover that we can really want something and believe that, man, if we could just have that, do that, then our life will be great. Then things will be wonderful. But then we actually obtain it or we get to doing it, but then we need more of it or we need it in greater in- intensity or we need something else entirely. And Moses understood that he could only endure if he was not centering himself on things that wouldn't endure, including where he looked for his satisfaction. And then it says he regarded disgrace, disgrace excuse me, for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasure of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. Uh, of course, this is Moses looking to where his treasure is, where his reward would be. You know, Jesus talked a lot about finding treasure. And one of the things that always strikes me about the way Jesus talked about finding treasure is that he did not say, you know what, you really ought to not look for treasure. Or you really ought to not look for reward because that would be so unspiritual of you. Jesus never said that. What did he say when it came to finding treasure? He says, absolutely look for treasure. Absolutely seek out reward. Be ambitious in this regard. Just do so finding it in things that will last. Because things that we search for in our treasures in in this life will not last. Jesus said, just go ahead and shoot for a treasure. Just do it in things that will be eternal, that will never fade or be taken from you. Moses understood all of this. And because he understood this, he was able to regard what was centering him, what was grounding him. Because he was looking for his ultimate identity and satisfaction and treasure in the one who will never fade, he was able to endure. The fact of the matter is, it is really easy for even those who follow Jesus for many, many years to look for, without even realizing it, our identity, our satisfaction, our treasure in things of this life and not even be realizing it. But only God can give us the meaning and hope and happiness we long for in a way that will never fail to deliver or break our hearts. And when challenging circumstances come at us, we will be grounded, we will be centered if we look to Him. But often we're not looking to Him. And that's why when hard times hit, we feel an overwhelming sense of sadness or despair or anger or frustration because we're not getting things like the control we really feel like we should be getting or the money and the status or or maybe the relationship or maybe the comfort or the pleasures that we just think, man, I just need that, whether we would tar- articulate it in our minds that way or not. We're living for these things. But if, it, if these are the things we're looking to help us endure, we're only as strong as they endure. How was Moses able to endure? First, he regarded. Second, we're told in verse 25, he chose to suffer. Uh, this is one of the things that especially stu- stood out to me in my study this week. Because what we've been saying so far in this series is that we've seen in these accounts of these ancient men and women of faith and how they were able to endure in spite of suffering, right? We've seen how they've been able to endure in spite of suffering. But here we're told Moses wasn't just able to endure in spite of suffering. Moses was able to endure in choosing to suffer. It says he chose to suffer. After being discovered for killing the Egyptian taskmaster, he could have created, concocted a story to get himself out of the whole deal and back into the good graces of Egyptian royalty, but he rejected that, knowing full well that it meant a life of suffering for him. But he understood that sometimes doing the right thing is not doing what's easy. Sometimes doing the right thing is not doing the easy or comfortable thing. And you know, when you look at the landscape of Moses' life and how it all played out for him, while of course this wasn't an easy decision for him to flee and just understand the repercussions of that, 
it is also easy to see, when you look at it on the whole, that it was a decision that ultimately helped him become the incredible person that he ultimately became. That decision shaped him. That decision sharpened him. I mentioned early on that Moses was a natural born leader, just physically, intellectually, just a gifted leader. But you know, if he had led his people out of Egypt back in that time when he took out the taskmaster, it wouldn't have gone well. I mean, just think about it. He was of the temperament, being a natural born gifted leader, still just kind of in a rash moment, act out harshly and kill that guy, which maybe it was just for him to do that because he was mistreating and beating and just, you know, doing a terrible thing. Maybe we could argue, argue that, but could you imagine if that version of Moses led the people out of Israel, the broken, shattered people out of Israel and out into the wilderness, it would have been an utter disaster. And what did the time out in the desert, all 40 years of it, what did that time do to Moses but humble him? And what's more, didn't that time also help this guy who grew up in Egyptian royalty, the top 1%, didn't it help him also learn to identify with the commoner? and the people that he would ultimately end up leading, let alone offer a time for him to draw near to the Lord himself, sometimes choosing to do the right thing isn't the easy thing. But Moses shows us here that this was key to his longevity, to his strength, and to his ability to endure. So let me ask, how are you at choosing the right thing, even when it might not be the easy thing? Choosing, say, to tell the truth when nobody would, would know on, on that business report or with, with this relationship, with this person in the family, like you could get away with it. Nobody would know. But what would that do to yours and my character? How would that shape us as we shift the line there? The Lord calls us not to just to follow him because he likes rules and wants to be followed. The Lord wants us to follow him for the sake of us being the people he created us to be, designed us to be. People who are strong and able to endure even in spite of hard circumstances. So Moses was able to endure because he regarded, because he chose to suffer. And then finally in verse 27, he was able to endure because he saw him who is invisible. Uh, before he died, knowing that he was getting ready to die soon, and they were, he had led all the people through the wilderness right up to the precipice of going into the promised land, in that moment, Moses delivered one last final sermon, if you will. And it's recorded in the form of the book of Deuteronomy that we have in the scriptures. And here's what he said in Deuteronomy 10, uh, starting in verse 12. He said, And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I am giving you today for your own good. What's he saying there? He's saying, follow the Lord, Israelites, follow God, but not just because it's, you got to do it, and even that it'll go well for you. He's saying, no, follow the Lord with it with the focus being, it being about a relationship. Follow the Lord for the Lord. Serve him and love him with your heart and with, with all your soul and walk with him. I think this is what it means when the Hebrews writer says that Moses looked to him who is invisible. Moses looked to God to center him. Moses looked to God to ground him, even in or especially in the midst of hard times. Meaning, not in just some abstract way, but in a personal, loving relationship. Again, Moses was going to God for God. And this helped Moses endure. Why? Because God is the only place we can find our ultimate sense of happiness and meaning and joy. Because he will endure. And that doesn't and won't change when things get hard. Now, Moses' example of enduring here is incredible how he was able to endure and have incredible impact in spite facing some tremendous difficulties. But when we see Moses here, we ultimately see the one who gave up so much more than the Pharaoh's palace. And we see the one who came to live among his people, 
but wasn't ultimately in the end, like Moses, received back into the fold, but himself was actually rejected by his own people. In fact, worse, he was killed by his own people. Hebrews 11 culminates in Hebrews 12, the first few verses, when it essentially says, look, we've been talking about all these ancient men and women of faith, their examples, We've been talking about people like Moses and how they were able to endure, but they only point forward to the one who really endured on all our behalf. That's why it says, look to the one there in Hebrews 12, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame. Now, why did Jesus go to the cross? Refusing not only fleeting pleasures, but choosing to suffer in such a way. Why did he do that? Because we are his treasure. He did that to give us life. And because he did that, we too can endure. And the very next verse of Hebrews 12 states it perfectly when it says, consider him who endured the such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. We can endure when we look to the one who endured for us. And what's incredible is while Moses was able to live, quote, by faith in looking forward and anticipating what Christ would ultimately do, we get to look back on the completed work of Christ and live by faith, knowing that he has already endured. And so to the degree that we let who he is and what he has done and how he endured for us, this is the degree we can begin to endure in the same ways. Which means if you're here today, and you've never put your faith in Jesus, this is the offer of salvation, the good news of Jesus Christ, that you can receive him and what he did for you on the cross. Receiving the forgiveness of sins, and that he died, and then God the Father raising him again to life on the third day means that when you put your faith on, in him, you too will have life, both now and forever together with him. And all that comes down to is receiving him by faith, by saying, Lord, I receive what you did for me on the cross. I put my faith in you and I choose to follow you. Would you help me even in that? And to all of you who have received him, this is an invitation to look to him who endured so that we too can endure, yes, even in, especially in the midst of hard times. It's a call to regard. Like Moses, to regard. But to regard the one that we know has already done everything for us. And if he's done everything for us, including not withholding himself, dying on the cross for our sins, how can we not regard that he will love us and be there for us and take care of us even in the midst of hard times? And then this is also an invitation that even in the midst of facing a hard choice, but it's the right choice, it will ultimately be for, for the good. Not only because it's good, because, but because it also will help us endure and give us the longevity and strength to endure. Now, I just want to real quickly preface, this is in no way to say we are called to go out and search out hard things so that we can endure. No, I'm just saying that if we are facing something right now, say this week or whatever it might be, that we know is not easy, but we know to be the right thing. This is a call to endure in that way. And then finally, and and most importantly, this is a call to look to him who is invisible, but not just the one who is invisible, the one who now has come into history to live and die for us and be raised to life that we too can have life in him. So how can you let who he is and what he endured for you help you endure? He wants to meet you in that place. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for enduring the cross. Uh, thank you for enduring that for, for, for us. Thank you for enduring so, so that we too can endure. Uh, would, you, would you please forgive us for how we look uh, uh, for, for ultimate meaning, hope, and happiness and things apart from you. And would you please help us set our hearts and find our treasure ultimately in you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, the one who endured. Amen. All right, well, let's continue this time of worship now through song. Unveil thy beauties to my sight that I might.
my love thee more Oh that I might love thee more Glory your creation shines Within the sacred world I breed in fairer and brighter lives A bleeding dying Lord See my bleeding dying Cheering beams of hope, fading hearts alive, fading hearts alive. Oh, how oh, oh, oh. too soon. Amen. We do pray that through this pandemic, we are learning to endure in important ways what it means to love God and seek Him as our source of true delight. Let's stop and worship God with our offering now. Lord, we trust you with what we have this morning as our provider and as our sustainer. We ask that you take these resources that you've given us the privilege to steward and use them to change lives here in the Silicon Valley this year. We love you and we trust you with all these things. In your son's name we pray, amen. As you've seen and heard today and on previous Sundays, we are making our way toward a new digital experience next month that will allow for a limited number of people to gather outdoors while we also live stream to those at home. This is not a decision we are making lightly. We have been almost entirely virtual for the last year, except for a few uh, small groups or meetings and our drive-through and service events all outdoors. We see and are watching the COVID landscape carefully, very aware of the virus-related risks, both personally and corporately. Our plans remain one step more careful than what is legally allowed within Santa Clara County right now. Are we excited about this new space? And is it super fun to hype? Yes, because we sense clearly that God is moving. He is the one opening doors and there is opportunity for life-changing, eternity-shaking work ahead of us as a church family. We hope that if you're excited, you'll step into the hype because that is a ministry in this season. Be excited, encourage one another and share that excitement of seeing God move together. We also want to be real that there is another important reality driving this decision. As you're all undoubtedly aware, there is more than just a viral pandemic at play after a year of isolation. There are skyrocketing rates of depression, marital and relational discord, struggles with mental and emotional health. Current is not immune to these struggles. There are needs in our church family and our surrounding community that as a church, we need to do our best to meet. We believe that these doors God is opening to us for outdoor gatherings are intentional and needed at this time. 
So as we walk forward, we ask for prayers. Let's be praying together for protection and for God to clearly lead us together. Wherever you are in your readiness to be in person, please know that there is a place for you to serve and to encourage one another. Whether you're eager and ready now to come check out this new space and help, or if you plan to wait a little longer and continue to engage with us online. If you are ready, there are opportunities to meet needs and we'd love to see you on March 7th, which will be our first official volunteer preview. There will be two services outdoors that day at 9.30 and 11 and the teams will be starting to train. You can let us know which service you'd like to come at currentsv.church slash relaunch team. The near-term plan is for volunteer preview services on March 7th and March 21st that get us ready for Easter on April 4th. Beyond that, we haven't committed to a frequency. We are taking it step by step. As a reminder, if you're interested more about who we are as a church and getting more connected into community, either in person or online, we'd love you to join us for a welcome lunch on February 28th. It happens over Zoom and our team will deliver you a Starbird chicken lunch. If you've never been to a welcome lunch, we encourage you to come. You can RSVP for this at currentsv.church slash welcome lunch. That's what we've got for you today. A lot of excitement ahead. We'd love to know how we can be praying for you. There's a button where you can submit prayer requests right next to the chat, or you can always use our connection form. We love you, current family. Don't, wor um, don't forget, uh, there are uh, V-Day donuts to be won over on social. Check us out over at current.sv on Instagram and Facebook. We hope you have a wonderful week, and we'll see you soon.
Jesus, it's you. 